during my uh, my biblical cosmology search, I was fascinated by Operation Fishbowl. Remember oh. that one? Yeah. I mean, just the name itself, really. You know, Fishbowl. Okay, that's 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 clever, right? But how? Uh, if anybody hasn't seen it out there, you need to look it up. Operation Fishbowl. They were literally trying to crack through the firmament. They're exploding, like you know. Uh, Anyways, I just thought that was well. Yeah, now this brings us to another interesting point. Is and I mentioned it briefly earlier. Is everybody is concerned with Antarctica? Mm -hmm. Something's going on down there. Um, you know, we had during the election. You know, John Kerry, right? Instead of being here for the election, he's down in Antarctica. Uh, you had um. Buzz Aldrin down there, and then you know, supposedly he had a heart attack while he's down there and had to be medevac. And there was a guy that was there, uh, Brad Olson, I think was his name, something like that. He was one of the researchers that was at the conference. You know, he had spent 26, uh, I think it was like 26 days on the ice or something like that down there in Antarctica. So he was talking a lot about the Nazi bases in Antarctica and all that kind of stuff. Um, he's like, to, to get medevac out of Antarctica, that's no small feat, you know, it was a it took pulling some serious strings to get him out of there. And then, you know, first thing he does, Buzz Aldrin, you know, tweets something about, you know, uh, uh, we're all in trouble, the horrors or something like, I forget what it was, but it was like, oh, some, yeah. I'm scared the crap out of him down pure there. Evil down there. Yeah. Pure evil or something. Yeah. I forget what it was. Uh, then that, that tweet was eventually uh, removed. I got to talk to Buzz about seven months ago. And um, he, as you know, the story goes, he went down to Antarctica, had a, a heart attack stroke combo, and came back. And, and then there was stuff on the Internet. And finally I had to look at Buzz and ask him, uh, Buzz, what happened down there, bud? Um, he's looking at me. And, he, and I've known the man since 1970. And um, in all the years I've known him, uh, Buzz is, is a tough guy. Y'all remember when he socked that guy in the jaw for saying he didn't go to the moon? And the judge said, uh, you know, case dismissed. You got what you deserve. And uh, so Buzz is not a, he, he's not a wim wimpy person at all, if you know him. And, um, but when I asked him that and he stared out the window, that's the first time I ever saw Buzz scared. And he didn't tell me what what's going on. It's what he didn't say that worried me the most. And whatever it is, um, it, really, it really frightened Buzz, and Buzz don't frighten easy. Um, I, you remember the circumstances? Uh, every, all these one percenters were going down there. It's like a new Disney world. Then Buzz has his um, health problem. Then it all just bang, stopped, like he threw a switch. Never heard any more about it. Nobody went down there. Nobody's allowed to go down there. And at that time, at exactly that time, when John Kerry had gone there, Buzz Aldrin went in November or something, uh, the summer months, I heard from whistleblowers that one of the alien presences had returned or was returning or was coming back into Antarctica and we had started clearing out forces. I would love to be able to present proof, but what if that is what happened? Well, Buzz did say one thing, and um, it just stuck in my head. It's the way he said it. He just said, um, we thought out things we shouldn't. And I went, what do you mean by that? Um, I was in uh, Antarctica for uh, two months, January and February. Coldest part of the time. I'm down there in 1973 for the United States Navy. Um, that's a great place to test probes that you're going to send to Mars. Or We tested Viking Lander down there because it's about 110 degrees below zero at the coldest. And um, if you think that's cold, Mars can be 250 below zero. So you put your machines out there and they run and we'll see if they freeze up or lock up and got to fix things. And um, so it's a great place to test. That's why I was there. But I'm telling you, it's a hostile world, y'all. Um, I'm in a special suit. The Navy, my master chief takes a can of water and throws it up in the air and it sounds like cellophane on a cigarette paper and it freezes solid and hits the ground. I go, God almighty. And he said, don't get out that suit. You'll live about two minutes. I don't plan on to. <laughs> so 
it, it's incredibly isolated. It's beautiful, but it's um, like Buzz once said on the moon, magnificent desolation. But let me, let me ask something here, and y'all can help me out uh, if, if, I got, if I understand this right. Uh, the ice has started melting due to global warming for whatever reasons that is. And it finally melted down enough where the satellites passed over and you saw the pyramid, correct? Wait, say that again? Not what? entirely, because one of the mysteries in Antarctica is that the East Antarctic area continues to build up ice, even if the West is melting. Yeah, it's true. Um, the Earth's name wasn't always Earth. It was called Snowball, if you look it up. And uh, we were covered in, in ice over the entire planet in the rotation of the of us going around the sun, the moon going around us, back and forth, back and forth, the friction finally thawed us out, and we got our world we know today. But at the poles, they're kind of not facing on the sides, they're facing up and down, so they're not going to be affected by the gravitational tides like that to enough where they're going to melt. But global warming entered the picture, and it thinned the ice down enough where you could see this image, and, and one way or another, they found this pyramid down there, and then I started me thinking, uh, it, I don't know if there's, I've never been down there, so I haven't seen any aliens or anything on board uh, in the pyramid, whatever. But think about this a minute. If all this happened and unfolded the way they did, um, then if Buzz saw something, and I don't know what it was, but it was, it was enough to give the man a heart attack. Um, so if there are beings down there, I would think these beings never planned on us. They've been there, you know, they came in millions of years ago. They've been under ice for millions of years. I don't think they were expecting us. Well, let me bring so, one more element into it that Linda touched upon, yes. and Michael Sala can talk about the Nazi connection. What is the... Alan, what, just before, yeah. and then it is that the whistleblowers themselves in the last two years suggested this to me, not as fact, but as inside scuttlebutt speculation, that there literally have been discussions that Antarctica 34 to 33 million years ago began to be plunged under ice because an alien intelligence or intelligences knew how to do this in order to have a huge, massive part of the Earth that it, the alien presence, could put off limits to humans essentially camouflaging and hiding themselves under thick ice deliberately because they can sustain with technology we don't understand 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit in these huge gigantic rooms with walls that glow, everything is self-activating software. And so it means in a strange way that aliens that may have been interacting going back to two million years ago in the genetic manipulation to create Homo erectus, that they could have had a base, quote unquote, right. at the South Pole to hide from their experiments. Uh, you had the uh, the patriarch of the was it Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, is it Russian or Greek Orthodox? I think it's Russian Orthodox Church, the patriarch of the Orthodox Church uh, and the Pope, who, who, who these have been kind of you know. These two factions have been more or less at war for you know, like a thousand years. You know, the the Orthodox versus the Catholic, right? Well, you got the Pope meeting with the Patriarch for this, you know, meeting in Cuba, and then right away, like I think the Pope went to Mexico, and the Patriarch goes to Antarctica. <laughs> you know, what? Uh, it, a lot of high strangeness happened in 2016, but I mean, really, the strangeness goes back to World War II and things that were found, uh, and actually even. Yeah, I would say, yeah, so, because when you look at the space program, we had the space race, right? Well, before the space race was the missile race, and that's what, Adam, you were talking about, where the first thing we were going down there, the Russians are going down there, we're going down there into Antarctica, and next thing you know, both of us are launching high-altitude nukes into the sky. <laughs> we call it Operation Fishbowl, which was part of Project Dominic. Mm -hmm. And the word Dominic, you look it up, uh, Pastor... Uh, um, uh, Dan Cressman out in Lubbock. He I was out at I was doing a Nephilim conference out in Lubbock, and he's like, uh, "Yeah, look up Dominic. <laughs> look up the word Dominic. The word Dominic is Latin. It means of the Lord." So our project was called Fishbowl of the Lord. <laughs> yeah, come on, and 
next thing you know, uh, we create NASA and DARPA at the same time. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency was created at the same time, 1958. Uh, and then we're in the space race to Russia. So, you know, whatever that means, we beat them. Oh, what? They just quit? Oh, you beat me. I quit. I'm going home. You know, no. They you look, they spent something like 40 missions down to Antarctica while we were, you know, distracting the world with Apollo. Mm. You know, and then, you know, because this is a, the Cold War, right? We're against Russia, the big evil Russia. Well, what happened right after Apollo 17 is we had the Apollo Soyuz. We had uh, Russian in uh, Apollo, American, you know, shaking hands in space, you know, Freemason handshakes. Soyuz and Apollo are shaking hands now. Houston, Apollo. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, and go great. The professor will show you if you enter my No, the professor will show you if it was a soft talking. Around the world, millions watch and listen as the two spacecraft become one. Now they wait for the next dramatic event, the meeting of Soviet and American crews. All right, on the show, Hawk Revive, you look free. Okay, the camera. Ha ha! Ah, it's just a Got it? It'll, it'll stay open. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Tom. Lexi. Just a moment. Uh, okay, turn on the camera. Hit the remote. Okay. Here. Camera. Uh, Glad to see you. Uh, here. Pass it to the legacy. Ocean Rod. 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 Right. <clears throat> we weren't at war. This was a big propaganda. Uh, you know, whatever we all saw down in Antarctica that led to the creation of the Antarctic Treaty and the missile race and everything else. So every country that was involved with the, the early 1940s and 50s exploration of Antarctica, whoever signed the Antarctic Treaty, in my mind, they're all in on it. At some high level, they're in on it. And then the whole world became a stage, and we were watching the show and you know taking sides of who we believed and which actors, whatever. But, I mean, this, Antarctica was a big part of this conference. Hitler was given basically safe refuge in Argentina and Colombia. So they did allow Hitler to survive the war. This, this was part of the deal, that Hitler and a lot of other Nazis would be given safe passage to South America, and they would basically live the rest of their lives in kind of like e pleasant exile. But the German nationalists in uh, Antarctica continued to work to complete their space program, to complete the construction of these uh, spacecraft, these real craft, these Hannibal craft, there was the Hannibal series of craft that were built, and, and German Space Command was set up in Antarctica. There was a whistleblower, well, actually not a whistleblower, a researcher by the name of Vladimir Tuzinski. He worked with the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, and he was the first to release a lot of documents showing what was actually happening in Antarctica with the, with the Germans, and uh, he showed pictures uh, which included German Space Command out of out of Antarctica and so they were launching craft to the moon to Mars and uh, this was where people first began learning that the German program out of Antarctica had successfully placed people on the moon and, and, in, and on Mars and were continuing to basically explore the solar system and all of that was conducted out of Antarctica. Wait, I don't understand. Were there Germans still there when Buzz Aldrin showed up um, just a few years ago? Was that the same German continuum? Well, the Germans have never left. Their bases are continuing operation to this day. Some are seasonal bases, some are permanent bases. But right now, there's only 1,000 people on that entire continent. And they're just like the skeleton crew of the bases that stay year-round. This is the fifth largest continent of the world, and there's a thousand humans on it. So you can tell how uh, desolate it is. But the thing about Buzz Aldrin, that there was this very cryptic tweet that came out during his stay down there. And he said, we have seen the faces of evil, and we're all in danger. Right. And this is right before he had his heart attack. And I can tell you, logistically, to do a medical evacuation from the interior of Antarctica is very difficult yeah. and very expensive. So something must have majorly gone wrong with Buzz. And that was December of 2017, I believe. Right. And in the work that I have done about the missing National Science Foundation scientists, and that goes to the work I've done with the naval flight engineer who was there in a C-130 crew that was assigned to take in 
12 or 15 scientists with a whole C-130 full of gear, and they went to Marie Birdland, which on that map, if McMurdo is down here on the west side, uh, Marie Birdland is here. Wait, wait, you're saying on this easy. map, where, where yeah. would it be? Here is where the missing, the missing National Science what Foundation is right. If you what? guys can see here, and here's McMurdo, and we're talking about East Antarctica over here, but probably Beardmore Glacier, as being where some kind of an alien intelligence has had some kind of presence, structures, craft, everything for at least, let's say, 34 million years. But you know, before you get to that, why don't we finish the whole German Nazi thing and talk about the Black Sun and how that relates to what you, your whistleblowers discovered, and then we can get to the missing scientists, right? I mean, well, it, it, to underscore the fact that when the C-130 crew had dropped them off, they disappeared. And then when they went to try to find them, there was nothing at the National Science Foundation camp at all. Nothing they were moving. gone, two, they a were dozen totally scientists. They were totally gone. And when they did show up, they had been missing for a couple of weeks. And uh, Brian S. and the C-130 flight crew were then sent back. And they were expecting that they would see this group of scientists out to meet their plane, doing this, yelling, something. And he said they were lined up like birds on a wire. They were all kind of next to each other, and most of them had their heads down looking at their feet when the C-130 was pulling up. And that somebody had to go from the flight crew over to the scientists and direct them to get onto the plane. And they talked about how not one single scientist said one word most of them walked with their looking down at the ground. Brian said when they got them loaded up, he said to his uh, flight chief, what in the world? Where have they been? And the flight chief said, I don't know. We can't get a word out of them. And during the flight, Brian went and sat down next to one of the scientists, and he said he leaned over and touched the scientist's knee. And the man never looked up, and he said, it was as if we were dealing with 12 or 15 people who had suffered post-traumatic shock syndrome, that they were unnaturally frozen in their position and no speaking, and that they all looked afraid. And the question is, if Buzz Aldrin had a heart attack, that's a leap of speculation because of what he saw and was exposed to, in one of these underground facilities that my whistleblower Spartan One has described, then was that hole, the big hole in the ice near Pole, where those scientists went, and did they meet face to face with the non-humans that have been variously described as hairless humanoids to something so strange that one of the seals that I have talked to that is not in the video said that as they walked for a mile or two miles into these very strange created architectures, they reached a point where something started coming through the walls out into the air. At first it would go in and out of visibility and then they realized that their minds were being manipulated and then when they could see it clearly, and it was coming in and out like a television signal in the air, it appeared to be covered with uh, scales, uh, like an armadillo, the surface of an armadillo. And he said, when you are face to face with something like that, and you are trained in military to kill but you're dealing with something you've never seen and it can go in and out of visibility and you know that your mind is being taken over by something that you are fighting. He said that happened in one of those corridors and that was 2012. So those scientists were severely traumatized and yes. they never come forward as a whistleblower, none of them.
Well, one of the things that I think uh, is important to emphasise is that uh, NASA was set up under German control, that uh, in the 1950s deals were made with the Germans in Antarctica where there would be technology sharing and the Germans in Antarctica would give the US administration, uh, the Eisenhower administration, technical and scientific assistance in reverse engineering some of the extraterrestrial craft and in return uh, the Eisenhower administration would funnel a lot of uh, resources, a lot of manpower and funding to the German space program in Antarctica. And, and the cover for all of this was the Apollo program. And the way they did it was they set Germans up who had been brought over under Operation Paperclip to run the Marshall Space Flight Center, which was actually in charge of the Apollo program. And the Marshall Space Flight Center was, uh, was run by Germans who were former Nazi uh, officers, uh, Werner von Braun and his deputy and the whole team of German paperclip scientists were put down there at the Marshall Flight Center to run the Apollo program. And also you actually had at the Kennedy Space Center, you had Kurt de Bus, who was another Nazi official uh, who was put in charge of the launching facility for the Apollo program right throughout the 1960s and 70s and all of the funding for the Apollo program, 22 billion a year, was actually a smokescreen for putting man on the moon because what was really happening was that they were funneling a lot of money that the CIA had, had getting through all their illicit processes uh, through NASA down to the German program in Antarctica to help the Germans to get not to the moon well, they got there, but also to Mars and beyond. So in my book, uh, the, the, that's uh, the latest book that's out there, the US Air Force Secret Space Program and, and uh, Space Force, it basically says, my argument is that while the Apollo program got Germans, sorry, while, while the Apollo program got Americans to the moon, it got the Germans to Mars and Alpha Centauri. Brad, yeah, and, thank and you. And just to follow up with what Michael s said, that the, the Apollo program was just a cover for the real technology that was in the secret space program. Much of that funneled out of Germany just before the war to these bases, uh, Point 11 New Berlin base, which Admiral Dolent said, we have created an impregnable fortress for the Fuhrer in 1943 and that is presumed to be this New Berlin base in New Schwabenland. Also when I was in South America, I was discovering that there are still these massive tracts of land in Chile and Argentina where also some of these scientists and laboratories could have gone. Mm. And what's so interesting in all this and what also uh, Spartan One has talked about, that in this big craft, is the black sun. Right, talk about is... that, Linda, because it gets even weirder, right? Yeah, it's I mean... a lot weirder. Yeah, and one of the most fascinating things in doing research into the history of the black sun, you can get it back into Mesopotamia. It is associated in Sanskrit with something that would sound like they are describing the soul, the animus of the body container. Can you describe but, what it looks like? Yeah. Um, ring, 12 arms coming out, at the end of each 12, two 90 degree angles. There's the first one, there's the second one, and each of the 12 arms has the two 90 degree angles. And so you have this image like that. And they found this in these underground and structures. The, and these uh, were carved by Spartan One's testimony, they were carved on the inside of the installation, and he had to, he had, he had been briefed that what he would be encountering were 23 foot high doors, 18 feet thick. All he had to do was put his index finger on the outside and touch and. <laughs> The entire 18 by 23 massive bass salt would move, he would go through, it would close, he would turn around and there would be the 23 foot by, I think it was 17 feet wide, black basalt with, up here was the black sun and down here was a star map. 
and the star map was being studied by an astronomer that was also, they had scientists there in addition to the language people, and the astronomer told Spartan 1 that one of the doors, they had, be, had put, taken the pattern, put it into a computer program for analysis, and it had produced information that there were three focal points in this one particular star map below a black sun, and that the three focal points, when they went to Hubble, they, it became a Hubble project to do a reality check on this. And Hubble, when, when they took the photographs of Hubble and they did the overlays and all of these things and found these three focal points, they concluded one was at the center of the Milky Way galaxy and the other two were in a geometric relationship to what they said were two universes outside of this universe. This is very hard to wrap our heads around, but just hang in there for a second, because as I continued to investigate the histories of the black sun and all of the related subjects to it, a man who is a physicist in England a month and a half ago or two sent me an email with an attachment that looked like the black sun. Not 12 arms, there were 18, but it was the same two 90 degree angles at the end. And he said, consider the possibility that this new physics symbol, arms with two 90 degree angles, and here is what it stands for in modern 2019 physics. If you accelerate an electric charge to the speed of light, it instantaneously turns into a sphere. And that pattern represents that in physics today. What if the black sun has always been an alien intelligence's representation of the network of portals throughout the Milky Way galaxy and beyond, and that this is how they move through the cosmos. Mm. It's the occult symbolism of the black sun being replicated in this age-old ship. Maybe the Nazis found it first, and then that became one of their symbols of their occultism. You mean the swat sticker? It was a, no, it, was well, even before that. I mean, th this is even a deeper. That, this is like the inside symbol where the swastika was like the outside yeah. symbol. Uh -huh. the, black, the black, you try to look. This is fascinating because I spent maybe a, an accumulation of five days going everywhere on the web, in old encyclopedias, in books, in everything, trying to find any photograph from World War II that would show the SS and Hitler with the black sun. If it exists and you can find it, please let me know. I could not find anything that had them all in one scene. It was as if Himmler, who I think Himmler probably made the decisions about the black sun as a symbol that would represent the SS. It is a German name that's Stoffersteffel, or I have a hard time pronouncing it, but it's the SS. And they were designed to be a intimidating and brutal security force for Hitler, and it was Himmler who chose the black sun to represent them. Now here is a classic example of something that had a history that went back to Mesopotamia. And it was not associated with brutal security forces in Mesopotamia, but they reached back from Germany to get that for some reason that I personally, this is just a personal opinion from all of the material I have been uh, swamped in for the last several months. I think they were dealing with full-blood ETs. I'm just going to say, I think that Maria Orsic and those blondes were associated with an extraterrestrial presence that was interfacing directly with some of the German power structure, and that I think they had portal abilities to go back and forth to different places, and that when Maria Orsic, who was head of the Vril Society, disappeared, 
during the war, I bet she ended up back on a planet in Aldebaran. I can't prove any of this. But what I think and speculate is that the black sun in Mesopotamia was there because extraterrestrials, full blood extraterrestrials, were the Anunnaki and the Sumerians. And that means that in the 20th century, at the time, as a DIA guy told me, quote unquote, World War II was an extraterrestrial war between competing, fighting extraterrestrial civilizations fought through human bodies, close quote. And if that's true, and if a lot of the wars going back through to Samaria, and I think Anunnaki was real, I do not think it's mythological, that there have been warring extraterrestrials throughout this solar system, and that the black sun was probably a technology representation that was used by one or more. It was there, the current ETs interfacing with Hitler during World War II knew all about that. They were influencing the development of the Vril and they had some relationship to the black sun and they inspired or told Himmler to use it. And that is how all of that came about allegedly in human terms in World War II. I think the biggest influencers were alien intelligences. Well, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you. Man, I'm glad you're sitting down. Wait till you hear this. <laughs> um, you know, I have this crazy memory. It's eidetic, and I remember things. And when you're coming out of a heart condition, you ramble, you got medications, and they're messing you up. But Buzz said something. It was a phrase, and he was just staring out the window when he said it. And I, I remembered it, but it didn't make any sense. Until you just said all this, and I went, holy smoke. You know Buzz fought in World War II, right? You know, he was, he was in the conflict. And it, this may not mean anything at all, or might really be significant, but he said, um, they're back and we're going to do it all over again. They're back, at, they're back, they're and, back they're and they're going to do it all over again. And it's why he said it, it's just like, it's how he said it. It's just like somebody's been beat to death, you know, and can, can you believe it? We're going to do it all over again. And that relates to what I was saying, that one of the possibilities that the whistleblowers raised is that one of the alien intelligences that may not be very nice <laughs> returned in 2017, and that when Buzz Aldrin went there, this is what they were worried about, is that something had come back and it was dangerous and they had uh, Kerry and Aldrin and the Greek guy there for reasons that are not clear, but the whistleblower says that is exactly the time that the unmentionable returned. Michael, uh, I yes. just wanted to bring, bring us back to this idea that uh, the US Navy knew all along that the Germans were working with this reptilian extraterrestrial group called the Draconians and that uh, Bill Tompkins said that these Navy spies would come into the briefing room at Naval Air Station San Diego and would be embarrassed to be saying that, well, you know, we saw these beings, these reptilian consultants, giving all of this information to the Germans or to the Nazi SS in terms of how to build these craft, giving them instructions to go to Antarctica. And, and that's what happened. And the Navy knew about this all the time. And so that kind of gives us a, a framework for understanding what happened in the 1950s when agreements were made with the Germans because uh, the Navy was aware of this. And, then, and the, a decision was made that the Navy would continue to work with the human-looking extraterrestrials that, ha that helped the Allied powers win the Second World War and that the Air Force would work with the Germans and the, their reptilian partners in Antarctica to try and get as much information as possible to build out their space program because I think uh, the Navy and the Navy's all, the US Navy has always been the custodian of the American Republic. They've been the ones that, that are the, the protectors and they were the ones that made the decisions at the very beginning 
Um, Secretary Michael, Forrest just for a second, do you mean that you're, from your point of view, that the United States made a kind of schizophrenic bargain, that they would have the Air Force would be collaborating with the reptilians for technology gain, mm -hmm. and the Navy would be collaborating with exactly. the humanoids and the hairless ones for allyship. Exactly, yes. That, that was a strategic choice, and it was, actually makes sense. You, tr you see there are both two different factions of extraterrestrials that have been fighting each other for who knows how long, and so you basically set up uh, an alliance system where you can learn and get as much as you could from each, each of those uh, uh, extraterrestrial entities and, and try and build up your own space program so that you could one day maybe match them. And so the Navy went down one track, and this is what William Tompkins describes, that the, that the Navy was actually working with uh, these human-looking extraterrestrials that were planted into the Douglas Aircraft Company in the 1950s and planted into other aerospace companies in the 60s that Tompkins says that basically were helping the Navy design these space battle groups for the future. All and blonde and blue-eyed, too. That's right, yeah. The, exactly and then the on the other side was... The Air Force was working with the Draconians and, and, their, and their forthright allies out of Antarctica trying to get as much information as possible. So this is, this is where you get the kind of German influence uh, over the Air Force up until pretty recently uh, where they were really helping the Air Force get as much of this technology as possible. So I think this is what we've had, is almost like a schizophrenic relationship. Um, and, and the US is unique because it is the only country in the world that I know of that has these different military services which are virtually autonomous. Could There's I... no other country in the world that, that has military services that are that separate and independent from one another. Every other country, you have one centralized uh, defense structure because that's how you maintain uh, loyalty. In the United States, and this was something that was the genius of the uh, founding fathers, I guess, that set up the, this kind of system where you have the army and the navy and the marines, and the air force was a much later creation. But the, each one was distinct and separate to each other and had a certain degree of autonomy. And then in 1947, with the creation of... Uh, the, the Department of Defense, you, you had it enshrined in legislation where these different military branches would be independent of one another, except for the Marines and the Navy, they would be both under one department, the Department of the Navy, but the Army and the Air Force and the Department of the Navy are basically independent of one another. And Michael, you may be describing why there is now an obsession about getting a space force for the United States to combine, yeah, to combine everything Space into command. an inertia because something may not be friendly that we're going to have to face soon publicly, and that may be what forces that headline out. We are not alone in this universe. Well, the we, Space Force. <laughs> Let your mind roam back uh, five or 6,000 years and think of the old ancient texts uh, about gods that may never have been gods. They may have been the full blood ETs that made Antarctica. And that there was conflict then as there is now. And the issue is which of those gods representing which ET civilization came back in 2017 or some semblance of it and why and what allies now the the whistleblowers so you don't do not feel panic you do not feel fear about this it's my understanding that our allies are that are not human are really helping us right now and the, but we all need to be able to stand up and face the facts that some things out there in the cosmos don't like all life in the universe and our particular Earth, probably because of competing civilizations at the time of the Anunnaki and way before going back at least 270 million years and probably half a billion. 
that there have been these waves and waves and waves of extraterrestrial civilizations on this planet. Someday we will know this. So that whatever the ancient conflicts have been, and the residues are now, whatever could come back, we have strong allies. So this means if we could be told all the truth, we probably would have to redesign and look at all of our ancient history and religions through completely different lenses. But it never means that there is not a divine field and that there are alien intelligences who respect that as much as we do and they are trying to help us. And that is the ground I'm standing on in the work that I do, and I hope you will too. Something tells me, I don't remember where I heard this, but something tells me, uh, we were reading Enoch chapter 10 earlier, and it says that, um, I think Azazel was buried in the desert, which is called Dudael. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of some part of me thinks that that's maybe where the fallen angels were, were buried and, and maybe released, and that was when they found this, you know, maybe that's, I don't know. Maybe that's that's part of this, but uh, well, Joshua says that uh, Enoch. You know, Scripture says that Enoch was not for God took him. Well, where did God take him? In in Joshua, it says he took him in a place of snow and ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ends of the earth. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And actually, someone tried to follow him. Someone tried to follow him that wasn't supposed to. Yeah. And when the uh, the rest of the men came to find that dude who who followed him, he said that he turned into snow. Snow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my family, uh, a bunch of us went and saw the the new uh, Disney Aladdin movie. And there was a part in the movie where the genie sends him to the ends of the earth and he ends up in a place of snow and ice. Mm. <laughs> and everybody, everybody in the aisle <laughs> looked over at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, something's going on down there. I mean. You know, the flat earthers are all interested in what's going on. Oh, they, but the, the, I didn't tell you about this. Um, let's see. It was Brooks Agnew was, uh, yeah, this one right here. I don't know if you can read that. Uh, Brooks Agnew yeah. was Friday morning, hollow earth, the origin and destiny of our planet. Uh, it was the first lecture that I attended. Now, he taught about something I used to believe myself, uh, the Neil Adams model of the expanding earth. That you know, you talk about Pangaea, and you know, any child can look at a map, and it, it looks like South Africa fits into Africa, or South America fits into Africa, you mm -hmm. know, it, like a puzzle <clears throat> in the Atlantic. Well, Neil Adams realized, well, it does. That's the most obvious because when you look at a globe, they're close. The, the Pacific spread is pretty broad. You know, you can't really visually make the connection. But if you look at the topography on the, uh, you know, so if, if this is Africa and this is. Uh, South America, you can see how they fit like this. Well, he realized that they fit this way too. And they fit this way too. Oh, and they fit this way too. So if that's the case, the only way for that to be possible is if the earth was like 60% smaller. And so if you shrink the earth down, then all the continents fit like a puzzle every way, you know, all the way around. And so the expanding earth theory is how it explains how Pangea broke up. Now I used to believe that myself taught it as recent as December, 2014. Uh, and that leads it to hollow earth because when, as the earth's expanding, it's, it's hollowing out. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, his whole lecture was about hollow earth and hollow earth, inner earth beings that are living down there. <clears throat> and that that's where the aliens have set up shop. And the other side of it is they, you know, they believe that, um, um, aliens from someplace had uh, populated Mars and Mars went through a catastrophe and they escaped in these huge arcs of some sort to Earth and they landed in what the area that we now call Antarctica and th those arcs have supposedly recently been discovered through uh, deep ice scans or whatever you know they're talking about scans that have seen these ships and supposedly some of our government and military has been down there <clears throat> so there's all this talk about Antarctica being the first place of you know that we colonized and everything, uh, and that the aliens landed there first and blah blah blah. So everything's pointing to Antarctica and to inner Earth, and that there may be portals to get in and out of inner Earth through, in their mind, the poles or the South Pole or the North Pole. Mm -hmm. So the South 
is intriguing and Admiral Byrd and all the stuff that, you know, people have researched on it and, and all the talks that they did on Antarctica were fascinating. But Brooks was the only guy that I heard that was more interested in exploring the North Pole. And he is actually putting together, uh, you know, trying to raise funds and everything and showed the ship and everything that they're going to intend to use to do a polar expedition into the North because he he believes that the there's the closest entrance for us to Argartha inner earth is through the north. We're going to leave from Ermanx, Russia. We're going to sail to Helsinki and then around and then all the way back to the point of origin. 15 days. We're going to survey 10,000 square miles of ocean in 15 days. It's mostly covered in ice. It is not a trip that can be made any other way. It can't be done by air. You could never do this by dog sled. Far too treacherous. The only way to do this, and to follow maybe in my great-grandfather, my great-great-uncle's steps, Sir James Ross, in the spirit of exploration, to conduct the greatest geological expedition in the history of the world, is to take this, the Arctica. They just finished building it. It is the world's largest nuclear-powered icebreaker. I say we can't go to the moon, we can't go to Mars, but we can do this. We can go to the North Pole. We'll break ice for eight days. It's not for the faint of heart, but it's sure gonna be fun watching those scientists cry. Yes. I'm going to show you what this boat looks like in its finished uh, form. It looks like this. Yeah, there's no other boat like this in the world. This is the only ship in the world that can make this trip. 125, it will, it will uh, seat, and the crew is about 125 people. It has a three-and-a-half-year fuel supply. No, we're not sailing it inside the planet. We're going to get close, and we're going to use that helicopter that you see on the helipad there, and we're going to fly over it and take pictures of it, and we're going to stream live, well, as live as we can, because there's no satellites that we can see from there. You know, the satellites exist in the southern sky. We're not in the southern sky. So what we're going to do is ping these packets to the western hemisphere, to the eastern uh, over in Europe, and then we will real-time those packets live as pay-per-view online. We think we can get about 10 to 12 million people to watch during this 15 days. We think that they'll pay 9 or 10 bucks for the two weeks to watch it. We could be wrong. We could be throwing our money up a horse's ass, too. But uh, we think it will work out. By the way, it's the roughest seas on the planet. That little 100-foot boat that... Brian Olson took? No, no, no. This is a 300-foot boat, and this is gentle. We're talking 10-story seas. It's not going to be easy, but it will be worth it. So we think this Hollow Earth expedition is the ultimate myth buster. We're going to conduct a lot of mainstream stuff, maybe some global warming. We can get some money from the National Science Foundation. We're going to talk about the origin of human consciousness. We think if we take this ship 500 miles from the nearest other porch light, we'll be the only consciousness signal for a long ways. We think if we can get the consciousness of that boat to a certain point, if there is intelligent life around this opening or inside this opening, that they will come to see us. And when they do, we will get it on film. And you will see it the same as we see it. Uh, and what surprised me that Brooks Agnew even showed one of the maps in his presentation, but wasn't aware of it. I said, well, okay, what do you do with the, the map that Mercator even drew it on his map, the Mercator map originally, showed the four islands, you know, four island separated with the four rivers coming from a whirlpool in the center with Mount Meru in the center of the whirlpool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was unfamiliar with all that. And I'm like, well, that, you know, that's the, I believe that that's the high mountain that uh, Satan took Jesus to, 
you know, Yeshua to the top of a high mountain where you could look out and see everything. I believe it was, a, it was the divine council meeting hall at the top of Mount Meru, you know, at the, the center right there. And so the North has, and actually uh, Zen Garcia has published a book, uh, Paradise in the Sides of the North and the Mount of Congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nice thick book. You got to love Zen. He's pretty thorough. Uh, but, but showing that, you know, the Mount Meru and the four rivers coming off of it and everything. I mean, you go back through ancient literature, this is talked about a lot, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, for us, that is much more accessible uh, than the South is. Right. So for me, I'm far more interested in this because if there is a magnetic lodestone mountain made of obsidian sitting in the center of a massive whirlpool <laughs> with four rivers coming off of it, you know, with four small islands in the center of the north, wow, that's like pretty huge. And possibly, uh, possibly projecting uh, Aurora Borealis. Yeah, well... You know, if you marry this with Andy Hoy's uh, circular dome tent model in the wilderness, mm -hmm. then, you know, the conclusion I came to, and I, you know, it sounds like he did too, was, well, uh, if the tabernacle was indeed a big six-story high circular dome tent, it's a earthly model representation of the thing that we're sitting in <laughs> right now. Right, right. In which case, the Holy of Holies being in the center would right. be tubular, you know, going up to the top of the of the dome tent. Uh, and the curtains that extend down that tube that surround the Holy of Holies had cherubim on them, you know. Right. Uh, then could it be that the curtain that is in the circular dome tent tabernacle is meant to represent the curtain that we now call the Aurora Borealis, which is the glory of God extending down, you know, over the divine council. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there four rivers coming from uh, Eden as well? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think Zen takes that position. I, I, I tend to believe that uh, the Garden of Eden is the land that we now call Israel. Uh, but, you know, everybody's got a view on where Eden is. And Atlantis, that one comes up a lot too. That's interesting. That's awesome. Atlantis. Well, yeah, and, and since there's supposedly no... Uh, no land there and no treaty against traveling there. There should be nothing, uh, no reason uh, can't sail right through there, right? Or do you know of any? Uh, well, there are there are no fly zones, uh, you know, and when you think geopolitically and Cold War, you know, that makes sense. You know, they don't want anything coming up, you know, the shortest distance for, you know, if Russia or China was to attack us would be up over the, you know, pole, you know, lobbing missiles and stuff. So, you know, the, the nation has established a no-fly zone, you know, where nothing's supposed to be going over the north. <clears throat> uh, so, but, you know, could it be that all of that was staged? I mean, th for people like us, like I, myself, I just said, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if we're at war with nations on the other side of the globe on the northern hemisphere, it makes sense that they lock down the North Pole. Okay, so I'm never going to question that, right? I'm like, well, of course, right. that makes sense. Convenient. But what people have said is, why is the South Pole also have a no-fly zone? Who's okay. down there? You know, mm -hmm. well, what? Why? Why would there be a no-fly zone down there? You know, so I don't. We're living in some crazy, interesting time, guys. And uh, you know, while everybody's looking at Antarctica, I think Brooks Agnew uh, has the right idea. And you know, Zen and I have talked about this on shows ourselves. I think the more interesting place and the more reasonably accessible place to be looking into is the north whatever the case may be that's where the truth lies the truth lies at the poles <laughs> yep amen or what we call the poles and and what's interesting about that is when you look on the globe there's essentially i think four south poles there's the antipode to the north pole which you know you look at the globe that's where the rod goes through with the little knob on the end oh yeah yeah that's not you know, that would be the, the geographical antipode to the north uh, right. pole, but that's not where the magnetic pole is. You right. Know, neither north or south align with that. But there's also, I think, uh, two other, they call them magnetic anomalies in the south. Uh, but what, you know, this ancient aliens crowd is spinning, and, you know, maybe legitimately so, is that there's some kind of craft down there that is causing this magnetic anomaly 
Mm-hmm. You know, and it was, uh, I think it was the second uh, X-Files movie uh, that dealt with that. You know, I understand people who want to shield themselves from pop culture, media, television. I get it. You know, I understand that. Um, and, you know, I think you, people who have that conviction should should abide by it. Myself, I believe I'm called to that industry. I'm mm-hmm. called to infiltrate, if you will, that industry. Yeah. So no, I totally understand. Totally I have understand. to... Um, you know, I have to, to some degree, I have to research it. I have to understand what's going on. I have to remain educated to what's going on in that industry. But, you know, I'm, frankly, I'm getting sick of dealing with Christians fighting about everything. Yeah. And I have to keep telling myself, they're not my audience. I love them. I, I, I would love to have their support. You know, I'd love to do this hand in hand. But we're so busy fighting about everything that we're accomplishing nothing. Mm, I agree, yeah. especially with, even just within the Torah communities lately. Is oh. been so much. It's it's been it's been really rough to see. Strategy is to divide and conquer. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. If he can keep us fighting ourselves, then we can never truly accomplish anything to reach the world. Meanwhile, the world says, "Hey, I got an idea," and you know, a hundred million dollars comes flying their way, and thousands of people come to collaborate with them, and they put out another Marvel movie or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're pumping them out like that they are so quickly mm-hmm. and you know i'm trying to get people to understand look i'm not trying to raise money for seeds so rob can go buy an island somewhere and you know take off with my wife and just you know whatever look any money that i got coming in right now that's not to pay my bills is going to the seed mm-hmm. you know uh why don't, you, why don't you let people know about seed? Maybe there might be some uh listeners in here that don't know about seed and then after uh, after you discuss that maybe we'll uh Maybe we'll shift to a few questions. We're coming up on hour three here in a minute. Yeah, I, I can't believe that really long. quickly. Um, long with the you're, you're right. When you said we might have to do a part two or three on this, I think yeah. you, I think you may be right on that. Along yeah. with the seed question, can you can you tell us how we can support seed as well? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I spent the entire month of February completely redoing the website, which I'll show you in a minute. But in the meantime, I also uh, contracted an artist in Venezuela to start working on the comic book, the graphic novel. And uh, he knows another guy in Spain that's kind of helping him as well. So I got a guy in Venezuela and Spain helping me. And so these are the first eight pages of, of the comic book. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. You can kind of see, I mean, the quality of that's good artwork. Book. Yeah, I mean, these guys are awesome. I am so, so totally jazzed with these guys. What's been cool working on this is because for me, this also acts like a storyboard. You know, when it comes to, you know, actually directing the, when we get ready to do the series, uh, as I'm writing this, this isn't actually in the television script. This precedes what you, in the television script starts with the crash of this airplane. This plane crashes in the Solomon Islands. That It opens with the crash. With the comic book, I thought, you know, I can go back and back up and explain how that crashed and why he's out there. Like, I know all these things in my head, but, you know, the audience doesn't know what's in my head. So as we were working on the comic book, it's actually really helping the television script out significantly because the the plot lines that I had already outlined are getting a lot deeper uh, yeah. in terms of what's happening. So it's been fun. It's been exciting. These guys work very quickly um, and I'm able to work well with them. So I'm really enjoying it. Uh, see the series.com is the, the main website. And this is the way it's been since about nine, uh, let's see, 2009 with the tree logo and the C and so, and no, the tree has nothing to do with Kabbalah as if Kabbalah (laughs) trees. That term has been thrown around a lot lately. Oh, these people are idiots. First of all, does that, does the bottom look anything like above as above? So below doesn't look anything like it. I see roots. Yeah. Well, guess what? Trees have roots. (laughs) It's not even mirrored. It's not even, yeah, Yeah, it's not even, it's not even mirrored. Uh, But anyway, you know, you can't fix stupid. <clears throat> uh, so, so is for people who want to sew into it and you click on that. It'll take you to a, a page that shows you how you can get involved. Uh, and there are diff- four different projects that I'm working on at the same time. The comic book, which I just showed you the novel. I hired a guy named Christopher Whitestone who did a really good job of taking the uh, existing screenplay of episode one and fleshing it out into a novel, you know, really expanding on it. And, you know, I just let him go 
I, I gave him a little bit of direction, but I said, look, you know, take what I've written and expand on it as you would in a novel. And in, do, in so doing, he came up with some really cool stuff that some of which I'm incorporating into the, the comic book now, even as, you know, we, we speak. Uh, so that's, I'm holding off on publishing the novel because they're kind of going hand in hand. It's like the novels really help the comic book. And as we're working on the comic book, I'm coming up with new ideas that I want to feed into the novel. Mm -hmm. So they'll probably both eventually get released sometime around the same time. The video game just had a really good conversation with my friend, Tony, uh, who contacted me. It was kind of funny. I was in the hotel room uh, at a conference I was doing and I was talking with Sheila and my sister had had a dream. She, called me up after she woke up from the dream and said, I really believe seed needs to be a video game first. And I said, well, that's wow. interesting because I've actually got ideas for the video game. And she goes, no, let me explain something to you. She had just had back surgery and, you know, like candy crush and temple run and some of these games, you know, everybody's playing. Right. Uh, she's, she's explaining, you know, the games that she plays and, and Sheila and my son and others, you know, they're all playing these video games on their phones and stuff. And, my sister said, you know, so many of these games you download for free, but if you wanted to go to the next level or you want to get hints or extra time or whatever, you pay, you know, a dollar or whatever for, you know, extra whatever. She said, I've been playing for the last four hours and I've already spent $10. And then she goes, dot, dot, dot. And I'm just wow. one person. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'm just one person. You think of the millions of people who are downloading games and playing these games. That may be the way we get this thing funded. Uh, right. Quick. Uh, so I had an hour long conversation with the video game programmer, uh, this afternoon and he had contacted me right after I had this conversation with my sister. I talked to Sheila about this. I get this random email and this guy says, Hey, I run a, a video game company. I love your seed project. I really think we need to talk. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Wow. <laughs> like the, the timing of that was like unbelievable. So, um, <clears throat> you guys can pray about this, but things are in the works in the very near future to do a limited fundraising campaign to, to uh, secure some of the programmers to knock out a couple of games that I think could be huge. So, you know, these are all, these three projects right here, all of any proceeds that come in from all this is meant to be fed into production of the TV series. So, you know, you can click on each one of these and it'll explain, uh, you know, what the project is a little bit. And, um, you know, you can read up on it and see what's going on with that. Lots of stuff you can check out <clears throat> there. And then there are options for people to give and how you can get involved. Now, what is Seed about? Well, I call it Seed for a variety of reasons. Um, one of those reasons being that I'm just planting seeds. <laughs> uh, just like Gene Roddenberry did. Amen. You know, just like George Lucas and everybody else did. They planted seeds in people's minds that made them fantasize and think about things. The difference is the seeds that I'm planted planting are meant to get you into research based on scripture. You know, whether it's my research, Tom Horn, Ellie Marzulli, Doug Hamp, you know, any of these guys that are out there doing Bible-based research on subjects of the Nephilim, UFOs, aliens, and all that stuff. How do we address these things from a biblical worldview? Stuff like that. <clears throat> so I'm planting seeds. Uh, I'll give your listeners and viewers a little hint um people ask me all the time about the two e's what's up with that well i stylized it in the font that i did for a reason because when you take the two e's and you put them together it forms the letter for the uh, the first letter of the greek word that is used for god theos so what i'm showing you is god is at the center of seed mm -hmm. subliminally um because one of the things that I saw is the devil puts stuff in plain sight all the time through symbols. Why? Because symbols reveal to those who have eyes to see and they conceal from those who don't. Mm -hmm. So he's been very effective at putting out various ideas, ideology, all kinds of stuff in plain, si in plain sight through symbolism. So naturally I'm loading seed full of symbolism, but it's coming from a biblical worldview. Um, if you click on the C link, that takes you into uh, the new site. Uh, it tells you all about C here, so you can read up on it here. Uh, here Now, if you click on this right here, enter the new site, it takes you to the new home page. This old site was HTML based. The new site is based on uh, WordPress. So it has a whole lot more functionality than the other one did. Mm -hmm. 
and it's more uh, mobile friendly. So, you know, scroll down with your, your phone and whatnot. <clears throat> if people really want to get an understanding of what the deal is with Seed, this first link right here is a 27-page PDF. You click on, click on that, and it really just walks you through what it is, taking it to a new direction, some of the stuff about the project, a, a general overview of the first few four episodes. If you want a kind of a high-level synopsis of what the first four episodes are about, you can read that. <clears throat> Right there, some development highlights, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing, research behind it, the graphic novel, fiction novel, and all that stuff. Here's an important page. Looking at the industry analysis, uh, I decided to look at the top grossing films from the last 10 years or 2008 to 2018. Black Panther, Star Wars, Rogue One, Star Wars, Force Awakens, American Sniper, Hunger Games, The Avengers, Harry Potter, Toy Story 3, uh, Avatar, Dark Knight. Notice anything? They yeah. all are in the same genre, basically, mm -hmm. sci-fi fantasy, with yeah. the one exception being American Sniper. Well, Seed fits all of those, including American Sniper, because Seed is an acronym for Supernatural, Extraterrestrial, and Exploration and Defense Joint Division of the U United States Special Forces. So they're sort of like the Special Forces guys to deal with the weird stuff, the X-Files, if you will. Oh, cool. <clears throat> so... You know, I I follow you through a special forces unit that, that is designed to um, handle these things. So I have the genre that is the most popular. It's that you know, this represents eleven point nine billion dollars a year wow. in income. Wow. Um, and then when you look at television and you realize that people watch you know four to five hours of television a day, and you look at the shows that I talk about, I, I always pitch Seed as Lost meets the unit wrapped up in the X Files. So it has the kind of the weirdness, mystery, and intrigue of Lost with the special forces, you know, story type ideas of the unit, which is a story about Delta Force. And, of course, the weird stuff of the X-Files. And Rolling Stone magazine and Hollywood Reporter both rank those in the top 15 of most popular TV shows of all time. And the unit ranking comparable in terms of, of views. So, you know, the... This has a page here on the importance of seed, why seed is so important. Well, to summarize that, we spent three hours talking about what is coming. Are you going to hear any of this in the church? No. No, no church is going to be preaching about this. You may be fortunate enough to catch a, a speaker at a conference talking about this every now and then, but are 7 billion people going to attend that conference or get the DVDs? No. You just put the stuff on YouTube, and you know our time is limited. If you saw the crank down right now, YouTube is about to shut down a whole bunch of channels. And when you look oh, at the yeah. criteria of the analytics that they're going to be using, uh, you know, sadly, I fit <laughs> several of the criteria. So you know, high probability, my days are numbered. You guys may be as well. So you know, where are people going to get information that's going to counter the Star Treks of the world? I'm not aware of anything that's going to work better than something like seed. You know, if it's not seed, it's going to need to be something else. But this talks about the budget and why we're talking about the numbers that we're talking about. Look, guys, this isn't cheap. When you look into TV series, and I got a, a example of a TV series, typical TV series, $3.5 million budget, where that money goes and what it's being spent on. Uh, seed will be in a comparable range, somewhere to three to four million per episode. Anything you're watching on TV is in that in that price range or greater. You know, a lot of the shows people are watching right now, actually, believe it or not, are in the six to ten million dollar range per episode. Why is this stuff so expensive? Well, you know, it takes money to make money. This, this is, a, you know, if you just watch all the the names at the end of a TV show or at the end of a movie, look at all the names in the credits. All those people got to get paid. And I've come to realize, you know what? It takes millions to reach millions. It takes billions to reach billions. Think about it. How many people do you imagine have been influenced in one way or another by a show like star trek well probably at least the same number of people as the dollars it took to finance all the different series within that franchise and the movies that they've produced i mean it's practically a one-to-one -one ratio and that's just one franchise so when you think about all of the stuff that hollywood has put out they reach hundreds of millions and even billions of people because they spend hundreds of millions and even billions of dollars it's just the way it is in, the, in that industry. I mean, it's a collaborative medium that takes a lot of people to make the stuff that we see on TV and on the movie screens.
And since Seed's going to deal with, you know, Nephilim giants and, you know, Book of Enoch type of stuff, CGI, you know, is expensive. You know, so that's what I'm up against. But I'm pretty encouraged, actually. There's a TV series currently being produced called The Chosen, which I highly recommend people check out, thechosen.tv. Dallas Jenkins, son of Jerry Jenkins, uh, co-author of the Left Behind series, got this idea to do an episodic um, television series, multi-season television series on the life of Christ and the disciples. Crowdfunded. He raised $10 million from 16,000 people. They're shooting it here in Texas. I've already seen the first four episodes, and I would recommend people check out the pilot episode you can see online if you just go on YouTube and look up pilot episode, The Chosen. It's like a 20-minute episode of the shepherds that encounter the birth of the Messiah. Uh, a very emotionally gripping show. Uh, that was what they used to sell this, and they raised $10 million from 16,000 people crowdfunded. So everything that I've been – I've actually had my business plan in place since 2010 – Everything that I wrote back then and what I was intending to do and what I'm still intending to do at Seed, they did with The Chosen. So now I have a working model that testifies to the proof of concept that it works. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it has to be done this way. I can't go through any studio because they will control the content, you know, censor us, cancel the project prematurely, and own the rights. You know, I can't do it. Um, this has to be 100% grassroots crowdfunded, and that requires... You guys, you know, mm -hmm. I've got a ton of information on here. You can read the pilot episode for free, episode one. Uh, you can listen to the audio drama we did in 2014. Uh, read the, watch the vlogs and stuff, look into the research. Uh, this video right here, what is seed? We'll explain some stuff. These are the four projects again. This is some of the goals, short-term goals that I have right now that I want to try to raise money for. How you can get involved. Right there, some frequently asked questions. What's up with the backwards E? What's up with the number 33? Why a TV series? How can I get involved? That's all right there. Lots of information in the blogs. You can go through there. So just on this homepage alone, there's a ton of stuff you can uh, check out if you want to understand what Seed is. And that's seedtheseries.com. Click on this button right here to start your journey. But that's how you can learn about the project and get involved. And Now, here's the thing. I've got 180,000 subscribers on YouTube until they cancel me. I've put out, I've got over 500 videos loaded on YouTube that I've uploaded for free. I've produced thousands of pages worth of content for free on blogs, BabylonRisingBlog.com, EframAwakening.com, uh, VirtualHouseChurch.com, RobsChannel.com, QuestForTruth.net, TestingTheGlobe.com, Facebook, Thousands of pages of blog content free. I've put up hundreds of hours worth of radio interviews that I've done with people and podcasts that I'm doing with people like you all for free. 10 years. I put up everything I've ever done is online for free. I'm just putting an ask out right now. It's the first time I've ever done this. Is that worth $30 to you? Yes, it is. Absolutely. $1 a day for one month. Absolutely. Absolutely. If 180, I got 180,000 subscribers. Okay, if everybody just said, hey, Rob, we appreciate all the work you put out there, you know, thanks, here's 30 bucks, I'm funded. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's how quickly it can happen. That's yep. how we, people say, oh, I don't have a lot of money. Like, you got a dollar a day? Could you give me a bottle of water every day if I was walking through the desert to try to reach people? <clears throat> it's just a, simply a question of whether or not you believe in this, in this uh, you know, is, has your used you to this point? Is he using you for this project? Is this something that they can see him using to reach an, an, an innumerable number of people? If the answer to those questions is yes, then why wouldn't we do whatever we can to, to support? I mean, whether I think the giving a, giving a couple of bucks is the easy part, really. Um, and uh, from there, I'm interested in looking at some of the other ways as well, like some of the scripts and stuff like that. But yeah, there's a lot in fact, let me go back over here um, to the uh, website. <clears throat> at the top of the website, you know, no matter what page you get on, you always have the same menu at the top right here. Um, on the updates link, if you click on that one, that'll take you to a page where you can sign up for my email list. I haven't really sent anything out on the email list yet, but I'm going to be using the email list for when we start getting funded and start, 
you know, needing actors and crew and all that stuff. Um, th that's the way I'm going to communicate with everybody. So you can sign up there, you know, on the right hand menu, there's giving options for people. And if you want tax deduction, um, see the series is not a uh, tax deductible organization. However, I am an affiliate of a ministry called uh, Mountain Movers International, who, when they looked at their mission statement and they looked at what I'm trying to do, they saw me as an extension of what they're trying to do. And so they took me in and said, hey, if you want to raise money that people can get a tax deduction for, they can contribute to Mountain Movers International through my reference ID. And aside from the admin fee, all of that would come to me from Mountain Movers. So if people want to contribute, but they want a tax deduction for it, you can use the green button right there and contribute through Mountain Movers. If you wanted to contribute through crypto, uh, I don't know if you've seen what Bitcoin has been doing, but man, it went from like 5,000 to 8,000 in the last month. So, you know, one Bitcoin can be an investment that just phew, takes off mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. You know, who knows? So there's stuff there. There's the Get Involved link at the top. And if you click on that one, uh, there's actually a survey here that people can fill out. And that helps me that, that all that information comes to me and it goes into a database that I can look at and say, okay, here's what people have talents and abilities in and I can categorize them so that when we're funded, I know who can do what and is willing to help. And then of course we've got merch. You got to have merch these days. <laughs> you click on the store and um, you know, if you want to get the book, there's uh, limited edition versions of it that are signed by me with a, a certificate of authenticity so who knows, could be worth something someday. Can you imagine getting the first script of Star Wars before Star Wars became Star Wars? Man. That's what could happen here. Uh, I've got T-shirts and stuff like that, like I've been wearing. And, of course, all the research that's gone into Seed. Everything I've ever researched in my life is going into Seed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all, that's all this stuff, various combo packs. You know, so all the funds that I raise here, uh, I'm, I've been blessed, you know, Father has blessed me with other sources of income that pay our bills, keeps the lights on and all that. Uh, although YouTube is, you know, threatening to take some of that away. <clears throat> um, the rest of this, this goes into the project, you know? So, you know, right now, let me just see where we are. I think we're at $26,000 have been raised so far. I've never done an ask like we're doing here right, right mm -hmm. now. It's always been a soft, hey, I'm working on this, guys. Check it out. You know, here's some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've never done an official, hey, guys, let's make this thing happen. Right. Right. Uh, so even I've got a, a small goal of 150000 right here. There are various stages that, you know, certain milestones will help me get people on board. I've got a lot of people in the wings that I have talked with that are willing to help, but they all need to get paid. So. Right. Right. When I have a budget, I can bring some higher end people in to do some really cool stuff. Uh, and obviously, the more funds we have, the more we can do. Um, if we can raise a half a million dollars uh, for 500,000, I can actually start building a motion capture studio here in Dallas and hire the artists and start working on building the CGI assets that we can really make some amazing things and create a trailer that can be used to raise the rest of the money. Wow. Uh, you know, honestly, if I just had all of my existing subscri subscribers just gave me thirty dollars, say, "Hey, you know what? We appreciate what you've done. Here's thirty bucks." Yeah, that's like five point four million dollars. Wow! We'd go in production immediately. <laughs> yeah, with yeah. that, I mean, because we could start working on probably the first two episodes uh, yeah. right away. You know, it's kind of one of those deals where it takes money to make money. Absolutely, uh, especially in this industry specifically. Exactly. Yeah. So, yep. um, that, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but you guys have expressed your support for Seed. What I would like to do is I've had other hosts say the same thing is say, listen, let's put together a, a united campaign where we just do that. Say, look, I don't know how many subscribers you got. You guys got 101,000 subscribers. I've got 180,000 subscribers, probably a lot of crossover. Mm-hmm got a lot of the same audience but there's probably some i have that you don't have and vice versa right that we just do co-promotion you know mm -hmm. hey guys you guys need to check out parable of the vineyard check out you know christian truthers you know subscribe to those guys you know so i throw some of my people your way and you mm -hmm. say hey guys you know what i think that what rob's trying to do with seed 
really needs to happen. Let's just make this happen, guys. I mean, we can do this. You know, and if everybody does that, we'd be funded before the end of this year. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah, man. Well, I'm I'm on board. I, I would definitely um, chime in for whatever whatever my voice is worth to uh, to get help help support this thing. I, I really I really think it could reach, like you said, just so many people. And uh, I mean, what other what other opposition is there in uh, to Hollywood? Wh where's our answer? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, here's the thing: uh, the tools that are becoming available right now. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted Seed to happen in 2010, okay? When I first wrote it out and outlined it and like, it's got to happen now. I'm so thankful in, in Yahuwah's sovereignty, he withheld it and hasn't allowed it to happen until now. I really believe it's coming. You know, I turned 50 in a couple of weeks. That's my jubilee year, okay? So 50, that's, that's a good year. That's my jubilee. <laughs> and it's also in the, uh, November, it'll be 10 years since the beginning of seed being, you know, first conceived uh, when I first started working on seed November, 2009. So I think this timing is right in those areas, but you know, me, for me personally, spiritually where I am, you know, in my maturity with God and all that, I think <clears throat> needed to happen. Right. But technology wise, I was originally thinking seed had to be live action. And, then I felt like the Holy Spirit really weighed on me one day recently. I had to watch Beowulf. I had seen Beowulf before, but I was like, well, I just, I just it was just overwhelming. I got to watch Beowulf. So I'm like, okay, okay, I'll watch it. So I watch it. Well, you know, it's an enjoyable movie. But I think the point was that movie was 100% CGI. Mm -hmm. There's a phrase called the uncanny valley. The uncanny valley is used in CGI to represent when you look at, okay, Anthony Hopkins, one of the main characters. There's a CGI Anthony Hopkins. You can tell it's Anthony Hopkins, but there's something a little kind of weird. Mm -hmm. and you're like, that's not quite right. They call that the Uncanny Valley. Well, that was 2007. The Uncanny Valley, let's say, was this deep, you know, in 2007. Right. It's like that deep now. Right. right. It's gotten so good that, and I've seen demos where like a, of two teenage girls talking to each other in a, like a cafe. Mm hmm you would swear it's two teenage girls talking in a cafe and then they kind of peel back and show you the wireframe and the CGI that this is, no, that's not, that's completely wow. CGI. Wow. And when I started looking into the state of the art in CGI and seeing how shallow this, the, the uncanny Valley is realizing if I do this 100% CGI, but to look like it's real, then that saves me a ton of money. And up front, there's a lot of money that has to go into building all the assets because if you do that, everything, you know, this, everything, everything has to be CGI, right? So you have to build it. <clears throat> but once it's built, it's in the library. All you're doing is moving it around afterwards. Right, right. As the series progresses, the cost gets cheaper as the production gets better. So, right. uh, and literally anything you can imagine, you can do. If you do it live action, you, you know, the Avengers movies and stuff like that's live action combined with CGI. There's a lot of logistics that goes into blending real with fake. Mm -hmm. Well, that all goes away if it's all fake. Right. The other thing is uh, basically all I need then to do is bring in my actors. I could record an entire season of episodes with my actors probably in three weeks. Because wow. all I need is the actor's voice and their facial expression. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they got facial recognition software that mm -hmm. translates to the CGI version. Oh, they've got these devices that you stand on and it starts scanning around you from your feet up to your top of your head and it creates Justin right there. There's wow. your computer and it looks just like you. Wow. So then all I need to do is bring Justin in to give me your voice and facial expressions that automatically translates into CGI Justin. And then, you know, I can have stage hands run around to make you run around but i can record your gait you walk a certain way that is unique to you mm -hmm. yeah we'll that into the character wow. and then, you know so <clears throat> the amount of money and the production value the money that can be saved and the production value that can be increased by doing it cgi is amazing and the other part is i don't have to leave dallas you know i don't want one of those hollywood marriages to break up because you're never home right and you're traveling around doing locations and stuff like that 
I have a one central location. Everything takes place here. I can supervise it, you know, and shepherd it right here in Dallas. Um, and with 500,000, I had a meeting with a friend who is a pioneer in the motion capture industry, works for Microsoft, wants to get out of there, wants to partner with me. Uh, that would, we could build that facility and we can get some, you know, high end, really good animators in there to start working on it. Right. So, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I mean, but it, I, uh, when it comes to distribution, the big ones are Amazon, Hulu, Netflix. Those are the big ones. Well, what's happened with that was CBS, HBO, other companies are saying, well, why would I direct all my customers to Netflix? Netflix has taken eight bucks a month making billions when I could create my own Netflix platform Hence, you have now CBS Access. What do they do? They create a new Star Trek series. Why did they do that? Because they know they have a huge audience already built in place. Mm -hmm. well, we can watch Star Trek Discovery, which I've never seen. I heard it sucks. <laughs> um, is on CBS Access. They didn't give the rights to Amazon, Hulu, or Netflix. Mm -hmm. So what it's doing is it's changing the consumer's way of browsing. In the past five years, it used to be, well, if I want content, I go to Netflix, Hulu, or Amazon. Right, right. And everything's there. But now CBS, HBO, all these other companies are creating their own version of Netflix proprietary for themselves. Right. It's changing your mindset. Well, yeah, I have Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon, but I want to watch Twilight Zone, so I'm going to go to CBS Access. Well, that's changing the consumers in such a way that it's going to benefit me because when I create C.TV, which I own the domain, C.TV, I could have my own Netflix platform without having to go to Netflix. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and the technology's gotten such that I can do my own advertising, I could do my own social networking, I can do my own marketing, everything, and I don't need to and I don't want to be part of the Hollywood system. Right. Exactly. To the gossip mill out there that thinks I'm a sellout. Look, I've been saying right from the beginning I don't want to be part of it. But the only way that's possible is if you guys out there believe in what we're talking about here and get behind it. Right. I can't do it by myself, but together we could all do it and make yep. it happen. Amen. Amen. Rob, it's, it's a pleasure having you on, brother. And um, I, uh, I'm really excited about you know Seed. Um, it looks like there's there was quite a few in the chat that were excited about um, sowing some seeds into Seed, and, and so am I. Um, so I, I pray that that will uh, that will go somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. I. Uh, because I did see some people talking about it. There's a page I literally just created yesterday. They could go to seedtheseries.com forward slash make it happen. And when they go here, uh, it says seed is designed to be a series which will take all the same research Rob Skiba has become known for and bring it to a much larger audience through the medium of science fiction and storytelling. Click here to find out how you can help make it happen. So if you click on that button right there, it takes you to this page, which is specific to this YouTube ask, and that helps me track what money came from where and what was most effective in my fundraising efforts. So if you click on, go to seetheseries.com forward slash make it happen and click on the link at the bottom there, it takes you to this page. You can read what I have to say here. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in trying to help make this thing happen and if you appreciate 10 years worth of me putting a whole lot of stuff out there for free. Um, this is a way to show your appreciation and um, I'll just go ahead and say thank you in advance. And I'd also like to say to anybody out there who has already contributed, whether for this or just for, to help me keep going along the way. I know I don't say it often enough. I don't show my appreciation often enough, uh, but trust me, I really do appreciate it. Sheila and I both appreciate it. So uh, we thank you guys for, anything you have done and are willing to do. We can't do it without you. So thank you.